Wonderful. Well, I'd like to start with a poem by Wendell Berry, and it's called The Peace of Wild Things. When despair grows in me, and I wake in the middle of the night, at the least sound, in fear of what my life and my children's lives may be, I go and lie down where the wood drake rests in his beauty on the water and the great heron feeds. I come into the peace of wild things. I come into the peace of wild things who do not tax their lives with forethought of grief. I come into the presence of still water. I come into the presence of still water. And I see above me the day blind stars waiting for their light. For a time, I rest in the grace of the world and I'm free. And it's a beautiful sunny day at the headwaters of the Paco Canal in Manila. And Gloria has taken her grandson, Gabe, down to the water's edge to rest in this piece of wild things. And Gabe is fascinated by the butterflies that are fluttering around him and by his reflection in the water. Research shows that being in nature um, reduces our blood pressure, our heart rate, and stress hormones, and also increases our sense of well being. But not that long before this photo was taken, this is actually what it looked like at the headwaters of the Paco Canal. And it was really a place where there was um, lots of sewage inflow and rubbish that was dumped and not such a pleasant place to be. But through a restoration effort, um, this is what it looks like today. And that's actually right there where Gloria is sitting on that walkway. And now the local people can come here and really find a refuge in the heart of the city. And the local kids, they like to come and look for fish and turtles when before there weren't any. Um, so it's a pleasure to be here today. Thank you so much for being here with me. And um, like Gio said, I've been an educator for Gaia Education and I'm also the co-director of Biomatrix Water. And we're really focused on nature-based water solutions. And I'm also an artist and I'm particularly interested in interdisciplinary collaboration between art and engineering and design and technology. And I'm gonna share with you today some stories of projects that I've been a part of or that I've seen because I feel like those are the ones I can really speak about best. And they're examples of the type of work that can be done and that is being done to bring water to life. So with the increase in urbanization and now over half of the world's population living in cities, it can be easy to forget that every breath of oxygen was created by plants, that every drop of fresh water is purified through the water cycle, and that every meal we eat was once a living organism. And here we find ourselves in a planet where we have really overconsumed natural resources. And there's degradation of ecosystems, loss of habitat, pollution, and the consequent of climate change, which will only continue to get worse with time. And how can we expect ourselves to be able to understand and protect the vital role of natural systems when we're so far removed from them? So what are some of the solutions and strategies that would be relevant for Gaia education and for bringing water to life? Well, I'd like to begin with renaturalization. And if we were to move to a new place, we could become renaturalized as a citizen of that place. And the same can be true for the earth, to become really a citizen of the earth and reconnect with wild places, with our own wildness as well. And it's really about um, acknowledging our interconnectedness with all of nature, that we are nature, 
that the separation is actually an illusion. And it's about connecting, connecting with nature and with each other to form communities and networks where we can actually make a difference. It's about rethinking design to be regenerative, uh, including ecological design and ecological engineering and a new way of thinking about and defining beauty, which I like to call deep beauty and which I'll come back to later in my presentation. And then applying nature-based solutions. It's integrating living systems into our homes and infrastructure so that we are on a daily basis around and experiencing the power of nature and these nature-based solutions. And it's about restoring degraded ecosystems. So if you were to wander through the heart of Manchester in England and come across this basin at the Bridgewater Music Hall, you wouldn't necessarily feel like you were coming into a wild place except for maybe you would because this photo was actually taken a few years ago and now it looks like this and it's actually a place where people come to really rest in that piece of nature and they have their lunch breaks here and uh, it's a very wild place right in the heart of the city graduation ceremonies happen here and people take their photographs in front of the floating islands and the floating riverbanks and in the music hall itself, they have concerts. And actually this summer, because it's been so successful, this transformation of the basin, there were a series of concerts that were inspired by the floating ecosystems and the idea of synesthesia and that uh, color can evoke thoughts of sound and vice versa. So how do we bring wildness into urban environments. It's not actually that easy because the urban environment is very hard and it's vertical and flat and dry and smooth. And what nature actually needs in order to be able to take hold is softness and flexibility. It needs slopes and contours and moisture and texture. The meeting place of any two ecosystems is actually the place of most biodiversity, often referred to as the ecotone. But in so many uh, urban and modified waterways, what we're doing is creating these hard edges of sheet pile or stone or concrete. And we're effectively destroying that um, vital place of biodiversity, that ecotone. Now river restoration can recreate the natural river banks and the meandering of the rivers. But often this isn't possible, especially in urban situations. And so floating ecosystems can be one of the nature-based solutions. And they can create a habitat for plants and plant roots and microorganisms and birds and butterflies and fish to all be able to re-inhabit this waterway. So here's an example from a natural setting where a floating ecosystem has just been planted and then over a few months, what you see is that you wouldn't know it wasn't a natural riverbank anymore. And then we did a swab test with this sponge on two sides of the riverbank, one that had the floating ecosystem and one that doesn't. And on the side that doesn't have the floating ecosystem, all that came up was algae. And on the side that does, you can see on the sponge, there are lots of different insects. And the same approach can be done in cities where we bring in floating riverbanks and floating islands to create habitat and help to bring the waterway back to life. In Canary Wharf in London, a grebe is nesting and she successfully hatched her chicks right beside glass and steel and skyscrapers. So water has commonly served as one of the defining and founding features of settlements. Rivers, lakes, and estuaries were once the heart of trade, transport, and leisure, and yet rapid urbanization has degraded the water bodies of our cities. And these waterfronts of today 
are typically incorporating things like docks and canals and flood defenses and stormwater channels and different types of retaining or containing walls. And so the result is that there's these many kilometers of hard concrete and steel and sheet piled edges. Um, but we also see these as a potential low hanging fruit and that they're underutilized actually today. It's very expensive to buy land in a city and yet we can put in a floating park right in the, right in the city itself in the waterway and create a new habitat. And one of the things um, that's a leading concern actually for water in the world today is the loss of biodiversity, both in and above the water. So introducing ecologically engineered systems, we can help to restore that river habitat and provide the habitat for fish, for birds, for insects, for the microorganisms. And it's these actually microorganisms that are doing a lot of the work when it comes to cleaning up the water. And it's really a breakdown uh, process in which we're breaking down um, long chain organic molecules into shorter train non-pollutants. So if you see here, you could see three parts, the plants, the matrix, um, which is made of recycled HDPE. And that comes from when they take out water pipes, they're then broken down and recycled and then used to create this floating ecosystem base, which then allows the plants to be able to have something to hold on to. It gives them that texture and that surface area. And then the plant roots reach down and on the roots form communities of microorganisms, biofilm communities. And we've done some research that shows that there's 12,000 square meters per cubic meter of surface area on these plant roots. So it's quite substantial. And in ecological design and nature-based solutions, we're really seeing um, ecology as our toolbox and the sun as the source of our energy. Um, some of the workers and the tools are the bacteria, which form these communities of microorganisms, the algae, the protozoa, and the microanimals. And protozoa is actually a great indicator of biodiversity. Um, we call it a bioindicator. And the more protozoa that you would find in the water, usually the cleaner the water is. So it's also a great educational opportunity. The next generation is going to be faced with many of the consequences of the actions that we've had in terms of degradation of, of resources and overconsumption of natural resources. And so it's really great for them to see positive solutions that are helping to bring water back to life. Um, in Chicago, where we work with our local partners, Urban Rivers, we have funding to create a floating classroom which will be a really exciting initiative. And it's about enhancing um, this recreational amenity. It's much more pleasant to be around a waterway, to sit, to canoe, to walk, when it's actually full of life and green. And engaging the community, uh, bringing people together. Usually people actually really care deeply about their waterways and they want to be able to come together and be empowered to make a difference. So one of the really exciting things that's happening is a movement to of living water cities in which um, people are choosing to create these eco corridors right through the heart of the city to take advantage of that of that low hanging fruit that I spoke about. And in Chicago, um, this has already been happening. And there's a big vision. It's already been phase one and phase two of this vision, which is to create the wild mile, which will be a mile long water park right on the Chicago River. And one of the really exciting things that they have done is actually to grow food on some of these floating ecosystems. And they call it river ponics, the first food crops that have ever been grown on the Chicago River. And they've grown cucumbers and kale and cabbages and beans and herbs, and they've had them tested as well. Um, and it's really agricultural runoff that is mainly polluting the Chicago River and not sewage. And they found that they are safe to drink, I mean, to eat. So this idea of having floating farms is one that I think has a lot of potential. People might not be able to have a garden 
or a backyard living in the city, but they could have an allotment down at their local waterway to be able to grow food. There's also the possibility to create floating eco-villages, which would integrate homes and offices with agriculture, with aquaculture, with wildflower gardens, with greenhouses and composting. Uh, we currently have some designs for floating beehives to increase bee populations in the city, and then they can benefit from all of these flowers and plants that will be growing along the waterways. In Rennes, in France, um, well, there's something actually really exciting about uh, the way that the French do their budgeting, and it's called the budget participatif. And it's about its participatory budgeting where they ring face a certain um, ring fence, a certain amount of money that can be used for projects that benefit the community and the community get to vote on what they would like to see happen. And in Ren, they voted to create a living water city and to put in an eco corridor right through their river, which is the river Verlaine. And uh, we think that this is the largest floating river bank of its kind. It's 658 square meters and it has over 6,000 native aquatic plants and over 25 trees. And at the launch of this, I hope you can hear this because I didn't test it. Um, there was a little band. And I think that that's uh, just a lovely example of how excited the people were and how involved they felt that just to celebrate this transformation of their local waterway with music and they had fishermen out and the whole community gathered around the river. In London, um, there are many different organizations and charities that have been working together to create the Living Water City London. <clears throat> And uh, this is Kingsland Basin, which is right off the Regent's Canal. And it's just recently been awarded special environmental status as a refuge for birds and insects and bats. And local resident Gideon Corby, who lives just in this building you can see there, um, has described living here. He says, it's wonderful. It's like being in the countryside. And it's really transformed his way of life um, and his sense of well-being just to be able to be around wildness and different species. And he's always checking to see what kind of birds there are and, and uh, spending time here. And it's, so it transforms your experience if you're living right here. All of a sudden this becomes a spot where, oh, I might actually sit and, and relax. And there was a think tank event this summer in London, a Living Water Cities event that included um, different, these different organizations and NGOs. There was um, exploration architecture, which are really biomimicry inspired architects and the Environment Agency, Thames 21, Canal and River Trust, and the Lower Regents Coalition. And there were different um, presentations that were given and everybody got a chance to speak and to have dialogue and at the end of this time, together, we put, we put together a little floating island slash boat slash orchard. And it was powered by a little solar panel and electric motor um, as a fun outcome. And it was quite a, a good way to bring everyone together. And, <laughs> And one of the exciting outcomes that came from that event was that one of the charities, the Lower Regents Coalition, which has many different volunteers who are just local people who live around the Regents Canal, they met with the Stonebridge Lock Coalition and the Lower Regents Coalition had helped to, to have installed actually many floating ecosystems on their section of canal. And so they went to Stonebridge Lock and helped them and taught them, this is Molly and David right there that you can see, to actually install and plant up their own systems. So it's really about communities being empowered to do it themselves. 
artists who live along the Regent's Canal were also inspired to create an art show that was part of London National Park City Week. And um, I was invited to be part of that show. And this is one of the paintings that I created that was really inspired by the life above and below the water. Um, the Canal and River Trust estimate that 570,000 items of plastic reach the ocean via UK waterways each year. And they say that over 80% of plastic pollution in the oceans actually comes from the rivers. So here where I live in Scotland, I often walk on the beach and I kept on finding that I was noticing shoes washed up on the shore. And as I began to see more and more of these shoes, I began to feel like it was quite a poignant metaphor for our heavy impact and our heavy footprint on the earth. And so I took these soles of the shoes and I cut them up and I integrated them into this painting here of a wave. And I call it the footprint wave that was in this show. And um, it's really about this clash between humans and nature, which can lead to you know, more weather events and sea level rise. And here you can see a detail of one of the soles of the shoe with barnacles that are growing right there. If you were to visit Brody Castle in Scotland and go down to the pond there, you would see another um, collaboration between art and nature. This was part of the Finthorn Bay Arts Festival and it's called a biosculpture. And it's really a floating series of islands that are creating marks on the surface of the pond. And local school groups came and they each planted up one section of these floating islands and it's wonderful because it's such a family place to come and visit. So these kids, they come again and again, and they get to see the ecosystem that they planted and say, I was a part of this art show. I was a part of this project. That's my island. And then this is an art show in Brody Castle stables. And it was paintings inspired by the life of the pond and the floating ecosystems. Um, I call this one infusion of life. And you can see that it's really about just that life that comes down through the plant roots, through these microorganisms and spreads out to improve the whole ecosystem. I'd like to share with you now a poem. It's an excerpt from Looking Glass River by Robert Louis Stevenson. Smooth it glides upon its travel. Here a wimple, there a gleam. Oh, the clean gravel, oh, the smooth stream. Sailing blossoms, silver fishes, pave pools as clear as air. How a child wishes to live down there. And I think that this poem captures that magic that many of us have found as children, just looking into water, playing in water, floating things in water seeing our reflections. And these are my kids, Jasper and Griffin, and we're down at our local river, the Finthorn River. And it's such a special place to us. And it really um, is a place that moves me on a deep level. And we can just spend hours exploring and enjoying the magic of this place. Uh, it also has entered into my artwork and this is some paintings that are in my house that are inspired by the flow and the uniqueness of the Finthorn River. From what water do you come? Where is your bone country? An artwork by Diane Archer. And I think this really speaks to the deep connection that many of us have to the water and to the waters where we come from and also the land, the land where our ancestors may be buried. And yet in these times, so many of us also have moved and live in different places than we were born. And so we might also not feel connected to our water or feel that we have this, this deep connection. But I think that it can be 
um, renaturalize that we can again form this connection through education and through spending time in wild places and through recreating wild places. Um, this is Madeline and she is really enjoying the magic of this little stream and connecting with nature and she's actually right in the heart of the city in what is actually a storm water recycling system, a sustainable urban drainage system that was created through the heart of Alexandra Park. And here you can see that it was made into a little meandering stream. These boys are pond dipping and they're pond dipping in what used to be a completely lifeless basin. And the birds were actually dying when they came here because it was so contaminated. And now they can pond dip and catch little mini beasts in their nets and it's a healthy lake. So with this increase in urbanization, um, the infrastructure in many cities has not been able to keep up with it. And UNESCO estimates that 80% of wastewater is released in the environment without adequate treatment in the world. And so in urban environments, that means it's going into um, sewage, into open sewage canals or rivers. Um, and it's not only unpleasant to be around, but it's also a health risk. And there are different uh, nature-based solutions that can be applied. Um, this was a pilot project from earlier in the year in Chennai, and it's a floating active solar reactor. And what it has is um, solar panels that power aerators, and um, then there are floating ecosystems and plants and plant roots. And there were lots of children and community groups who came and helped to plant up the islands and to launch them. And then underneath the ecosystems, there's a liner so that the water can actually be sampled as it enters the system and as it exits the system. And this one um, is a small research um, project, but it's treating the wastewater equivalent of 200 um, people. Um, per day. So every day it's just out there, powered by the sun, cleaning the wastewater for 200 people. So you could imagine that this, if this was implemented on a bigger scale, it could make a difference to the water quality within a canal or river. And then that water can be recycled. And then um, one of the great benefits of actually adding active treatment to eutrophic canals to these heavily polluted canals by sewage is that there's a substantial reduction in methane. So one of the calculations that we've done is that there's a reduction of approximately a thousand tons of CO2 equivalent per kilometer per year. And the calculations that go into creating these active systems um, are based on lots of years of research to, to find out what they're possible and what can be achieved and how much aeration you would need and how much solar. So you may have heard that Chennai has been in the news recently um, because it's one of the cities that has run out of water and it's really in a crisis situation. They've had to be bringing in trains full of water in order to keep people alive and the city running. And um, incorrect water management, deforestation, industrial agriculture, and the erosion and loss of topsoil that can come from this, and the impermeable surfaces in our cities can lead to less rain, which leads to drought and desertification. But there are also nature-based solutions that can be applied, such as tree planting and conservation and creating water retention landscapes so that the water doesn't just flow away, but it instead is able to actually sink into the land and refill the aquifers. And there's systems such as check dams and swales and terraces, along with sustainable earnage drainage systems. And of course, improving the quality of the soil through organic farming methods and restorative pasture methods.
So there's an absolutely wonderful project in Chennai as well that is using many of these different solutions. It's called the Adya Punga, and it's a section of inland waterway from the Adya Estuary, which is known as Adya Creek. And the government of Tamil Nadu worked together with an NGO, Pichandi Kulam Forest Partners, and they went to this place that was really a dumping ground, actually, and they removed 150,000 tons of construction debris and rubbish. And this was over an area of 58 acres. And then they planted over 90,000 trees, of which there were 172 different species of trees. So this picture here is from 2008. And then this is how it looks now. And there are actually, now that they've identified 10 species of mammals, which hadn't been there before, 90 species of birds, 39 species of reptiles, and amphibians, 56 species of butterflies, 20 species of dragonflies, 30 species of fish. And it's also a water retention landscape so that the water is able to infiltrate here into the soil and not run off. It's also a place full of art and the artist Eric Ramana, um, Ramanujam and his team have created incredible sculptures and paintings and mosaics that you can see as you walk throughout the park. And it really attracts tens of thousands of people to come here and enjoy this oasis actually in the heart of the city and also be inspired by the kind of transformation that can happen in a relatively short period of time. It really feels like a wild place full of trees, full of clean water, full of different species. There's also a proposal in the works to the Climate Challenge Fund for another potential solution to this water crisis, which is to create decentralized nature-based wastewater treatment. And that can be wetlands, uh, reed beds, ecological tank or lagoon based water treatment or in canal treatment using floating ecosystems. And then that water can be recycled for non potable uses or used to recharge the aquifer with recharge wells. Another factor that comes into play is agriculture. And in India, 85% of the water that is used is used for agriculture. So there's a huge room for improvement there. Um, there's a project which Harriet Watt University in Edinburgh is doing in which they have 40 farms that they're working with and they're applying um, weather forecasting with self-learning algorithms that control a precision irrigation. And that involves drip irrigation, micro sprinklers and watering underground. And they found that early results are showing there's a 70% decrease in water consumption and pumping energy and a 30% increase in crop yield. So this picture here is showing okra. And on the one side, you see the okra that was grown um, with lots of water and it's the smaller one. And the other one is grown with this precision irrigation and it's actually the much bigger one. And whether or not it's using this kind of smart technology or not, what's for sure is that there's a lot of scope for improvement in agriculture and the agricultural use of water. And part of that is about the methods as well and employing more organic farming methods, which help to hold the water in the soil and improve the topsoil instead of degrading it. So this is a poem by David White and it's called Where Many Rivers Meet. All the water below me came from above. All the clouds living in the mountains gave it to the rivers who gave it to the sea, which was their dying. And so I float on cloud become water. 
central sea surrounded by white mountains. The water salt, once fresh, clouds fall and stream rush, tree root and tide bank leading to the river's mouths. And the mouths of the rivers sing into the sea, the stories buried in the mountains get out into the sea and the sea remembers and sings back from the depths where nothing is forgotten. And these are maps of the water basins created by Robert Zooks, who's a Hungarian geographer. The living things in a watershed form a closely interconnected web of relationships. And all water is one water. We are all upstream, we are all downstream. In Cochabamba, Bolivia, young farmers are painting a mural of the water cycle and understanding our interconnectedness and its interconnectedness. In the same school, the wastewater from their toilets is flowing into the ground and polluting the well where they get their water. And so they built a simple constructed wetland, also known as a reed bed, to clean the wastewater. And the flowers that grew in this wetland were so beautiful that the students would come and they'd gather them. And this is Carmen and Esperanza who are gathering the flowers. And they would take them to the local cafe in exchange for food or a drink. And I think of this as a real cycle of beauty from wastewater to flowers to food. And I call it deep beauty. And I think we need to rethink how we define beauty. Too often, the things that we create were formed from taking natural resources, mining them, consuming them. For a short time, there may be a beautiful product, but then all too quickly it ends up as rubbish on the rubbish dump. And instead, I think that real beauty, that deep beauty is cyclical that it's beautiful in its birth, in its life, and in its death. And it's about seeing through time to the past and the future in order to determine whether something actually is beautiful. I like to say to my sons that in nature, there is no rubbish dump. The waste of one species becomes the food for another. And so we can see some of these problems, some of these waste sources as potential um, areas where we can actually benefit from them and use them and create new cycles. Um, if you were a student at Manchester College, you could come and visit and eat from this growing dome. And here they're integrating um, fungi, worms, fish, and vegetables in symbiotic relationship. Um, Fridjof Capra says this beautifully in this quote, a major clash between economics and ecology derives from the fact that nature's ecosystems are cyclical, generating no overall waste, while our individual, I mean, while our industrial systems are linear, discarding waste in production and in consumption. So we need designs that are looking to nature as our teacher, that are regenerative and restorative. Um, biomimicry can be a source of inspiration here with asking the questions, what would nature do here? Seeing nature as a model. What wouldn't nature do here? Nature as a measure. And why or why not? Nature as a mentor. And so if we combine a wise use of modern materials that whenever possible are recycled and recyclable with this ecological toolbox of nature-based solutions, then the outcome can be regenerative instead of consumptive. 
So some of these nature-based solutions that I've mentioned are constructed wetlands and reed beds, floating ecosystems, sustainable urban drainage systems, active island reactors, solar active island reactors, smart irrigation and water recycling, floating farms, decentralized wastewater treatment, green corridors, and water retention landscapes and aquifer recharge wells. So you can see that there are many nature-based solutions that help bring water back to life. And I'd like to conclude with holding the vision for more living water cities, like in Wren, where the people chose to transform their river into an eco corridor, and more integration of ecological infrastructure into our homes, neighborhoods, and daily lives. May we work together to restore degraded land and water, because they are, of course, interconnected into thriving, healthy ecosystems. And thank you. And if you're interested to hear more and see more examples, I did a TEDx talk a couple of years ago, which was called Wastewater to Deep Beauty, and you can find it on YouTube. So thank you, and I'm ready for questions.